In the world of video games, large, impressive boss encounters are always something to look forward to, and Final Fantasy has been quite exemplary in this regard. But for a series with so many memorable and iconic encounters, it can't be too surprising to learn that sometimes boss encounters have ended up missing the mark. Whether it was a missed opportunity for an epic final showdown, encounter mechanics that just weren't quite engaging enough, or the old bait and switch. Some bosses just didn't live up to the build-up they were given, and ultimately left players thinking, is that it? And it's these less than engaging encounters that we're going to focus on today, as we run through 7 bosses that left players a bit underwhelmed, with the stipulation of there only being one boss per game. So with that in mind, we're going to start things off with Foras from Final Fantasy XV. There were many evil figures encountered throughout Final Fantasy XV, but due in part to the disparate nature of the wider universe, with it being spread across multiple media formats, many characters who should have had more of a spotlight often found their roles diminished. This was evidenced by Ravis, but also Idolus Aldercapt, Emperor of Nivelheim. They both had important roles in the Kingsglaive movie, suggesting there was more to come in the main game, but they ended up being sidelined. Unlike Ravis, however, who did get an epic and final showdown against Noctis, Idolus' fate was confined mainly to player inference and only truly got clarified in chapter 13 verse 2. Presented as the de facto ruler of the Empire, Idolus commanded considerable resources and a vast army of Magitek soldiers, but he was once a kind and benevolent ruler, and his demeanour only changed drastically in the lead up to the events of Final Fantasy XV after he was introduced to a certain Arden Izunia. He drove Idolus to desire the Lucian Crystal, promising immortality in return, and this feat was achieved after an impressive ruse that saw Regis outfoxed, at least in the short term. Despite achieving the desired result, Idolus would later fall foul to Arden's Star Scourge, but as the game lacked explicit exposition to this fact, the player had to figure this out through interactions with the demon known as Foras. Appearing in Chapter 13, the player first encountered Foras alone as it hunted Noctis through the abandoned Sagnatus Keep. Also seeking the Ring of the Lucii, Foras would repeatedly ambush Noctis, and although it's possible to fight back, doing so was ultimately useless as Foras would just respawn. Once Noctis reunited with his party, the player would encounter Foras again, but even though it had the ability to hit pretty hard, it would ultimately prove to be a simple and fairly routine encounter. It was only when the encounter was finished, however, that it would be made clear to the player that Foras was in fact the Emperor himself. For all the pomp and circumstance surrounding this character and his motivations, this was likely meant to symbolise how the mighty had fallen, especially as Foras could even be encountered as a generic enemy later on within the same chapter. Being the first Final Fantasy game on the PlayStation 2, Final Fantasy X was a landmark entry, and it featured some of the most unforgettable boss fights in the whole series up to that point. Battles with the likes of Unalesca and Sin left memorable impressions on the players, but some of the game's most iconic fights were against the infamous Seymour Guado. Outside of being a fantastic antagonist, Seymour fulfilled an archetype that Square had been using for some time, which would see a rival introduced and then fought against multiple times throughout the course of the game. These characters helped to motivate the player, push the story forward, and often had tragic and sympathetic backstories. In addition, the boss battles against these rivals were frequently amongst the best in their respective titles, with some even transcending that and becoming iconic showdowns outside of the main fandom. Ultras, Cypher, and Kuja each fit this description, and each time, the quality of the recurring encounters increased. And with Seymour, all things pointed to that trend continuing. First introduced upon the player's arrival in Luca, Seymour sought to end all suffering in Spira by becoming the next Sin. Similar to Cypher before him, Seymour's role as a rival was then firmly established through a gameplay segment where he appeared as an ally prior to any head-on encounters, which in this case happened to be the ill-fated Operation Mehen. Tidus and the party then later encountered Seymour at Macalania Temple, where a difficult boss battle against him and his Aeon Anima would ensue. Following this, he was also encountered during the Bavel and Mount Gagazette segments of the game, with each fight being a little more difficult and involved than the last. In fact, Seymour's third encounter on Magazette, Seymour Flux, was seen as such a difficulty spike by players that many consider it to be one of the hardest mandatory fights in the game, being edged out only by the likes of Unalesca. With such a reputation to live up to, both in terms of gameplay and narrative build-up, it was unfortunate that Seymour's fourth and final incarnation, Seymour Omnis, then didn't quite hit the same mark. Fought inside Sin towards the very end of the game, Seymour Omnis was an interesting fight, 
Accompanied by four large discs known as Mortophasms, the battle would see Seymour cast a wide variety of powerful elemental spells, with how the player interacted with the Mortophasms deciding what Seymour's next round of a casting would consist of. In addition to this, the Mortophasms also dictated Seymour's elemental weaknesses and resistances, and the player had to pay close attention to ensure they were attacking him with the correct elements to cause damage. Finally, after being directly attacked six times, Seymour would cast a spell on the party, followed by Ultima. While certainly engaging, the mechanics that made the fight interesting also led to it being a lackluster end to Seymour's story. And this was because, rather than pushing the player to their absolute limits in terms of strategy like the previous encounters, the elemental mechanics instead opened Seymour up to multiple strategies which resulted in near invincible party setups. Using Null spells was the obvious choice in this encounter, as Seymour attacked almost exclusively with elemental magic, but when combined with armor that nullified or absorbed his attacks, or weapons equipped with all four elemental eater abilities, some basic strategies trivialized the encounter as only Ultima was able to hurt the player in a meaningful way. Upon its release, Final Fantasy VII wowed players with its fantastic graphics, and while regular enemy encounters benefited greatly from this new tech, it was the boss fights where the game truly flexed its muscles. Battles with the likes of Genova, the weapons and Sephiroth himself were truly impressive for the time, and the development team at Square really went out of their way to make sure that the encounters not only looked fantastic, but also had interesting and challenging battle mechanics. Some of the more memorable encounters with regards to these mechanics were the various high-ranking Shimra officials. From Rufus to Hojo, the Turks, and even Proud Claude, these battles often featured multiple stages, annoying status effects, and sneaky tactics meant to throw the player off. Unfortunately, one Shinra executive, the butter tea drinking Palmer, was not cut from the same cloth as his colleagues. Typically, when the boss music started in Final Fantasy VII, players would prepare for the worst, as the game had few giveaway battles, but Palmer's encounter was a far cry in terms of tone and difficulty. Wielding an impractical handgun and dancing around, Palmer primarily attacked the player with weak elemental magics and was easily and quickly defeated due to his low HP and stats. Once defeated, his farcical charade continued as players were treated to an in-game battle sequence featuring Palmer barely surviving a near collision with the tiny Bronco's propeller before being hit by a truck and launched off-screen prior to the battle results being displayed. While this encounter certainly hit the joking tone it was aimed for, it was a little disappointing that one of the most involving and visually interesting scenes in Final Fantasy VII was ultimately a pretty underwhelming fight. Summons have played a huge role in a ton of Final Fantasy games, and some of the most memorable were in Final Fantasy VIII. Known as Guardian Forces, Final Fantasy VIII saw many fan favourites like Ifrit and Shiva being featured in more involved and story relevant roles than ever before, alongside a robust cast of newcomers. In the past, most summons were obtained by being found, bought, given, or fought against, but in Final Fantasy VIII, some Guardian Forces were also obtained through the traversal of dungeons. While not a series especially known for mind-bending puzzles, these caverns and catacombs proved to be the perfect place to stick some of Final Fantasy VIII's most useful summons, such as Brothers and Bahamut. But there was one dungeon that was unlike the others, the Centra Ruins. Home to Odin, the Centra Ruins were located on the Centra continent, and it featured a mechanic that was no doubt meant to reference Final Fantasy V, where Odin was obtained by defeating him before the timer ran out. In this case, the dungeon itself had a timer associated with it, and players would need to navigate through and then defeat Odin within 20 minutes. While an interesting concept, Wally players would have made sure to use GF abilities such as Encounter Half or Encounter None to make progression swift, giving them plenty of time to square off against Odin, a summon who would often provide a tough challenge. But in this particular instance, Odin would never fight back, and would just stand there until his health was diminished. Even at level 100, Odin would only have 31,000 health, so even a moderately prepared party would have no trouble defeating Odin within the time limit, which would have turned what could have been a pretty stressful encounter into one that was very easy to defeat, and would end up becoming a bit boring, and ultimately underwhelming. Final Fantasy Tactics is well regarded as one of the hardest Final Fantasy games, and Tactics Advance continue the trend in grand fashion, delivering on the promise of difficult, engaging, and tactical combat. As the original tactics set the tone, providing punishing boss encounters against the Lucavi, players would find many parallels in Tactics Advance when battling against the Totema, who defended the crystals that Marsh would need to destroy in order to return home. 
each totemer would put up a solid resistance from attacking players with powerful abilities to bringing their own party of additional monsters to fight, and this was first evidenced in Mission 005, Twisted Flow. Consisting of a battle against Famfrit and a party of Ariman, the encounter represented an early wake-up call not just due to the strength of Famfrit, but also Roulette, an ability used by Ariman capable of instantly knocking out any character. After Famfrit, the next totem it encountered would be Ultima in Mission 008 called Hot Awakening. Given its central role in the story of the original Tactics, one would have expected Tactics Advance's Ultima to be another challenging fight, with even the leading cutscene and boss battle music reinforcing this idea. But upon starting the fight in earnest, players quickly found out they were in for something a little different. Being teleported inside the totem itself to do battle from within, the player was not met by Ultima itself, but instead eight Ultima crystals. Sporting no direct attacks and only one ability, Logos, which could charm the party, these crystals posed little to no threat to a prepared player, and many players just use this as an excuse to level up their characters. In the end, Obtaining Ultima's Totema just didn't live up to the precedent set by similar encounters in the series, even if it did serve as a useful way to gain a couple of extra levels. Final Fantasy XIII sought to reinvent the series for HD consoles with a focus on its setting and fast-paced action, but its developers still tried to pay homage to past games, albeit in creative ways. This occurred mainly through referential names for things like the Falci themselves, but also extended to in-game locations, eidolons, and enemies, such as the first one encountered after the introductory cutscene, the Manusfin Warmech. This was a rough allusion to Warmech from the original Final Fantasy, but as it served as the game's tutorial fight, it also had a lot in common with the Guard Scorpion, as it featured scorpion tails and weaponized claws. Encountered three times in the early chapters of Final Fantasy XIII, it was towards the end of the game, in Chapter 12, that Lightning and the party once again encountered another iteration of the Warmech. Based on the previous encounters, players would have no doubt expected this to be a souped-up version that would present a stern challenge, especially as leading in, Lightning would summon Odin, and the fight would begin in Gestalt mode. Instead, they were treated with what can only be described as a cinematic encounter. Being nearly impossible to lose due to the Warmech's weakness to Lightning, the battle mainly consisted of using the Auto Gestalt command until Zantetsuka was available to finally finish it off. While this boss was a fun callback to the original Warmech, and an example of how far the Lassie powers had developed over the journey, this particular iteration was sadly a distant shadow of its namesake's reference. And that brings us on to our final entry, which comes from the game with more bosses than any other, Final Fantasy XIV. Drawing obvious inspiration from the judges from Final Fantasy XII, the members of the 14th Legion struck an imposing figure upon their introduction. And in the case of Livia, this was because she was decked out head to toe in white armor with her forearms outfitted with large blades and gun barrels. Similar to XII, the 14th Legion also didn't just look the part, they were ruthless within the narrative, with Livia and her comrades falling firmly into the heartless military commander archetype as it appeared that no one was safe from their hair-trigger use of violence, including their own subordinates. But when encountered, the hype didn't manage to match up with the bluster, and this became a reality when the players first clashed with a member of the 14th. Fighting Rattatan in Cape Westwind, players would find that, even on release, the battle proved to be incredibly straightforward. In fact, the Cape Westwind encounter was so notorious for being easy that it became a bit of a meme within the community. Following this, players would encounter Livia as the next member of the 14th Legion. As the final boss of her respective dungeon, to get to the arena, players had to partake in a lengthy and drawn-out infiltration sequence with frequent mandatory cutscenes. When finally encountered, players would find Livia seated in her white Magitek armor, and they expected an epic encounter to ensue. But once engaged, the first phase of her battle consisted of little more than loading missiles into artillery to fire on her while the party's tank drew her attention. Once defeated in this manner, she would abandon the armor and fight the player's party head on. But like Rattatan before her, she too would fall with little effort. It should be noted that as of patch 6.1, many changes were made to the duties and boss fights mentioned in this entry though. Firstly, Cape Westwind became a solo duty instead of a trial, meaning players now take on Rattatan on their own in a more involved encounter. Furthermore, Livia's dungeon was also to be shorter and is now more in line with the standard experience. Finally, Livia's encounter itself also lacks the first phase, and the difficulty of the encounter has been brought more in line with the current normal mode content. For the purposes of this list, however, these changes just lend further weight to the idea that in the original form, these encounters did little more than add length to an already lengthy mandatory portion of the main story, solidifying Livia's place as an underwhelming encounter. <laughs>
And with that, I think we're done. They were seven of the most underwhelming bosses you can encounter across the entire Final Fantasy franchise. Be sure to let us know in the comments below which bosses you feel didn't live up to the hype. And of course, if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd love to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, DeLivestream, Gregory and Zdorn, who are super special Onion Knight supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.